In 1879, British archaeologist Wayneman Dixon successfully retrieved a number of mysterious artifacts from within the infamous lower northern shaft of the Great Pyramid of Khufu. One of these artifacts was a small piece of a square wooden rod which has since disappeared, the only artifact to conveniently go missing and the only artifact which could have produced an accurate dating for what seems was a rather elaborate prior attempt to overcome a sophisticated array of blocking stones and vertical passageways which confront all who try to breach the innermost sanctums of this mysterious pyramid. The reason for this past mission, or indeed who undertook such an attempt, remain a mystery, but their motive will soon become clear. One of Wayneman's other finds, resembling a small grappling hook with two rivets, matches two holes in a square rod still lodged up in the vertical northern shaft, clearly left by these wannabe tomb raiders. It seems that these highly talented, acrobatic grave robbers couldn't make it any further, and once one becomes aware of the existence of a large hidden chamber built into the pyramid's design, placed just above this unexplored shaft, you will inevitably begin to wonder what could possibly be hiding up there. Indeed, it's a well-known fact that the builders of these structures were notorious for their superhuman efforts in concealment. Huge multi-ton blocking stones in front of the entrances to their kings and treasures, and indeed in front of virtually every interior shaft and room within the Great Pyramid of Khufu. The upper region of this northern shaft constitutes the last remaining unexplored areas due to the impossible access angle. We know it's there, and all we have to do is apply existing technology in getting in there, Rudolf Gattenbrink told the press. It must be noted, although the mention of tombs has been made, the evidence to suggest such is based solely upon a number of parchments and a single mark found within an interior chamber of the pyramid naming a gang and the 4th dynasty Egyptian pharaoh Khufu. Egyptologists have taken these fragmentary factors and concluded that all pyramids were therefore built as tombs, the Great One being built over a 10 to 20 year period, concluding around 2560 BC. It seems the entire thesis of ancient Egyptian legacy is built around a few mentions of the pyramids as tombs. No mummies or burial artifacts except a tiny box claimed to be that of the sarcophagus of Khufu has ever been found in the pyramids. Additionally, and perhaps more importantly, Khufu's Egyptian civilization, along with all subsequent and prior dynasties, catalogued tremendous details regarding their existence, yet all, for some reason, seemingly forget to mention the construction of the biggest, most mysterious structures on Earth or indeed how they did it. What could there possibly be hidden within this chamber, this unexplored and clearly sought after secret room, a room which is seemingly unrobbable? With mainstream Egyptologists, archeologists and academic historians alike insisting that these amazing pyramids were once unquestionably tombs which were robbed completely over the millennia. Whatever this room contains, may settle this once and for all. We have often postulated as to the precise age of the great monuments of Giza, undoubtedly the most astonishing structures left by the ancient world. There are many questions which persist regarding this ancient site. Who built these extraordinary buildings? Why did they build them? And of course, when was this unimaginably enormous task undertaken? Interestingly, there exists an enigmatic statue, which it seems, although predictably little shared by academia, actually predates this astonishing time within Earth's history. Quoted as, possibly one of the rarest finds of its kind, according to Dr. Clarence Epstein, Senior Director of Urban and Cultural Affairs at Concordia University, where this remarkable item is housed. Not only can no one date the object, but there also exists a language etched into its form which is yet to be deciphered. As Dr. Epstein acknowledges, no expert, among the countless he has personally consulted over the past decade, can identify the sculpture's age, artistic tradition, or indeed recognize and decipher the ancient language found etched into its base. Dr. Epstein believes the statue is of a pre-dynastic age, 
It was originally taken from Alexandria by the Diniacopolis family. It was then shipped with 20 crates of antiquities from Egypt and the Middle East to Canada, where it still resides. However, its whereabouts prior to the shipment are unknown. The statue is of two nude subjects standing 67 centimeters high, one male and the other presumed female. This figure is also noted as possibly holding a child. They are depicted in a sitting position, with noticeable elongated skulls. Now known as the Starving of Sakura, this due to the figure's emaciated frames, just what could this statue represent, or indeed be trying to tell us? How old could it possibly be? And most interestingly of all, what could the enigmatic writing upon its base actually mean? As more research is undertaken, it is only a matter of time before we know its true identity once and for all. We recently covered the ongoing debate regarding the true age of the Great Sphinx and the recent controversy found in the geological evidence which indicates that the monument, long taught to be a mere 3,000 years old, is, in reality, as much as 800,000 years. This evidence is based on erosion patterns and their shared characteristics with coastal erosion patterns. Additionally, we also covered the remarkable discovery of a possible second sphinx found a short distance away. However, what we didn't cover was the anomalies that can be discovered regarding the continued mainstream posit of the Sphinx experiencing modern manipulation, and the possibility that the face now found upon the Sphinx was a much later, even possibly modern addition, now concealing the true identity of the Sphinx. We have touched upon the rather amateurish stone cuts that are visible around the Sphinx's headwear in the past, along with its ears and many other interesting yet largely unknown and we feel academically ignored features found all over the Sphinx's face and head. From the neck down, the Sphinx still shows its age in all its glory, not only a match to the far more eroded, now unrecognizable second monument found a short distance away. The question is if mainstream academics or those bestowed with the responsibility of protecting the Sphinx were not aware of the controversy in regard to the Sphinx's true identity all these years ago, then why did they do these works? Why did they clearly implement great efforts, and clandestine at that, if they were not aware of its fragile and seemingly hung existence, hung off a far older relic, not only hiding its true age, but continually pushed as the authentic original appearance of this great monument? Not only is our evidence mounting in regard to the true age of the Great Pyramids, and possibly for this exact reason, the numerous additional works clearly made by later yet also advanced ancient now lost civilizations are now visible to all who visit these monuments. But it seems that the cracks are also beginning to form, thankfully only within the modern paradigms, in regard to the true identity and true age of the Sphinx as well. Who built the Great Sphinx? Who added the head we see today, one now synonymous with the plateau? Why were manipulations done to the head, clearly to preserve it, yet in complete secret? We find our research and the mounting evidence supporting our posits highly compelling. The Necromantion Once used as a Greek temple of necromancy, devoted by the Greeks to their god of the underworld Hades and his female consort Persephone. This site was believed by the Greek devotees to be the door of Hades, allowing entry to the realm of the dead. Located at the meeting point of the Acheron, Pyriphlegethon, and Cocytus rivers, which were believed to have also flowed through the kingdom of Hades. With names given to the rivers, presumably by the Greeks, interpreted to be joyless, burning coals, and lament. Whilst other temples, such as the Temple of Poseidon at Tanera, the temples at Hermione and Cume in Italy, and Heraclea within Pontos, were known to have been used for the practice of necromancy. It was the Necromantion that was the most famous of them all. According to ancient Greek beliefs, while the bodies of the dead decayed in the earth, their souls would be released 
traveling to this purported underworld via fissures within the earth. These spirits of the dead, according to the ancient Greeks, were said to possess abilities that the living did not have, including the power of precognition, the power to foretell the future. They therefore claim that these temples were erected by them in locations that were entrances to this mysterious underworld, used as altars for the believers of such to practice necromancy, a belief form of communication with the dead. This practice was attempted in order to receive prophecy. However, if one explores the architecture of such site, not only does this ancient Greek claim of construction become a clear, dubiously attested claim, but the evidence for highly advanced precision block building, now known as polygonal masonry, is discovered throughout the site. This existence of such sophisticated block building, which is not only found within and upon nearly every as yet unexplained ancient site upon the Earth, but is incredibly similar in form to that of many other ancient sites within Italy, specifically the ancient wall which can still be found surrounding the Acropolis of Alatre and at other sites, including within the ancient ruins of Delphi. This astonishing feat of ancient engineering is as yet unexplained by modern academics, strongly indicating that this ancient site was originally built by a civilization now lost to history. Furthermore, like the enigmatic metal clamps, whose remnants are to be found within a number of these same ancient sites that were originally used by this highly intelligent group, these went utilized to keep the stones in their fitted positions as they shifted and settled over the millennia. These clamps' design vary from continent to continent. Our reason for mentioning this curiosity is that although the sophisticated methods of creating these ruins often remain similar or the same, depending upon the continent they are found, is dependent on the style and material these methods are made from. This, to us, strongly suggests that these ancient structures may have indeed been built by the different races, found within these differing countries. The commanding force, the leading power of these groups, was the same worldwide power and font of this knowledge, who, with their clearly incredible technological prowess, successfully created such structures, and indeed the Necromantion, which, regardless of their tremendous age, has successfully survived a vast amount of millennia, successfully making it into our own modern ancestors' lives, predictably adapted due to their wondrous nature, into their historical belief systems, often being adopted surrounding spirituality, either for a theistic worship, burial, or in the case of the Necromantion, for the use of contacting the dead through the mystic teachings of necromancy. It is, undoubtedly, highly compelling.